friends, I'm DJ Lance Rock, and I have to say, Rock and Roll Grad School is awesome! This is Rock and Roll Grad School with your hosts, Heidi Hedquist and Luke Poling. The beat goes on. Hello, kitties. We are going to have a real good time together today. Unfortunately, it is just me. Uh, the band is on hiatus. We will be back together next week. But right now, Heidi is in Pittsburgh cutting her solo album. And yeah, like I said, next week, everything would be back to normal. However, this week, we've got a great conversation with you and Heidi was here for it, so you just have me for now. We are talking with Gideon King from Gideon King and the City Blog. Gideon is a guitarist, jazz, blues, everything. Uh, he refers to himself as a, a Big Apple musical diplomat and um, they have a new single out right now, Somewhere Only We Know. and bunch of interesting things in our conversation. We talk a lot about music, which I guess kind of makes sense. Um, but yes, enjoy our conversation with Gideon. We will have the full group back together next week and so much more. Peel away that pretty bar Take deep root in my soul Cause it's 2 a.m. in East New York and I'm cooking. I gotta say, I really love the single, the, it's, all of it. It's got such a unique sound and such an, and, and so it was not, it was a little bit of a surprise or maybe not reading the press notes where it says that you refer to the group as a blog, not a bl band. And that this just amalgam, how, why do you account for that? Is it just being I'm, open to working with the other band, folks? Yeah, the band is called Gideon King and City Blog. And the only reason I named it City Blog or use the word blog is just because, you know, it's um, there's a lot of cross currents in this music. There's a lot of pop. There's a lot of jazz. Uh, there's funk. There's there's Latin influence. Um, and so um, I'm influenced by everybody from Neil Young to Steely Dan to to be honest, Mozart. So, um, you know, a blog is something that is kind of uh, ongoing, ever-changing, and um, kind of protean, kind of flexible. And so that's the reason I stuck Gideon King and City Blog in there um, and, and named the band that. But I do, in fairness, um, I do think of it as a band, um, <laughs> not, not as a blog, quite literally. But it has, I hope, that free-flowing, ever-changing nature to it the way that a blog might, if you know, if you know what I'm getting at. Mm -hmm. Why do you account for that sound? That is so you. Um, I mean, you know, like you. You know, when I was growing up, um, my brother was a real prodigy jazz musician, and um, my parents loved classical music. They were classical music snobs, and my sisters were hippies. Uh, or at least hippie wannabe. And they were um, listening to Neil Young and Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin and Seals and Croft and man, you name it. Um, and uh, I liked all of this music, but I didn't love it. And then Steely Dan came walking into my life by virtue of um, the song Dirty Work. Um, <laughs> And that was, of course, more of a rock pop song that doesn't actually typify their sound in general. But then I got into Steely Dan and I and I and I learned from Steely Dan that it was cool, that it was OK, even potentially commercially successful um, or commercially viable, I should say, to blend rock and jazz. Um, and so they changed my musical life. Um, and uh, and 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 so 
the sound that we have that I think you may be referring to, which is that sort of crossover sound with maybe slightly more abstract lyrics, um, I'm embarrassed to say is, is really inspired by Steely Dan. I'm, a, I'm like a Steely Dan um, uh, wannabe. Uh, for lack of a better, uh, not very, not not very good marketing to say you're a wannabe, um, but I admit that in some ways I am a Steely Dan wannabe, as I am a everything else wannabe. Um, right. But they really influence me. But that's the thing that that you know. And then of course my love of Neil Young and my love of everything from Seal to uh, you know to to um, Miley Cyrus. Uh, uh, so that that sound is a, a reflection of these eclectic inputs if you want to accept that, that way of describing it. Yeah. And I think that idea that, you know, strange chords uh, and, you know, diminished sevenths and such are, they won't hurt you. Yeah. Basically. I, yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, yeah, you can play this. Okay. My guitar's out of tune. Don't pay attention to that. Right. Um, or, you know, uh, you can play this, you know, you can play. Okay, and they're both D chords, and one's a D9, D major nine, and the other's a straight D chord, but there's all this color. Um, there's all this color and this extensive beauty um, associated with the second one as opposed to the first one. And there's nothing wrong with this. There's nothing wrong with that, but it, right. but it, isn't, it isn't as expanded uh, as maybe the other one. And it sounds a lot cooler at parties when you're saying, yeah, it's a D9 you know yeah. yeah that's true i just don't know if i'm ever going to be invited to any parties that's the real yeah part. that's <laughs> uh, you could do have to wedge it into conversations i feel like <laughs> exactly. yeah exactly. it's not right. a natural uh <laughs> right yeah but by but just by having the guitar you can wedge it into the conversation i feel right totally oh, this whole thing? right yeah what yeah listen oh. it worked for, it worked for jackson brown and ed sheeran so why not me, right? absolutely yeah. exactly i mean come on man anyway yeah so how long were you working on these songs before you took the studio? Are you always kind of tinkering in there? Oh, well, are you are you referring to the songs in this latest EP, Splinters? Yeah, exactly. Um, oh, a few years. Um, I'm always writing songs. I always have um, a number of songs that are sort of half-baked, uh, and they're sort of half-done, sort of done, and they're in various stages of acceptance or rejection um, and development or deconstruction. And uh, and so I was working on those for a few years. I bring this, the music and the lyrics to my band, um, which is really an amazing group of, of, of musical, uh, sort of like a, a murderer's row of musicians. And, um, and uh, we just, we just, we just do surgery on them. They're mm -hmm. not that good when I write them. Um, frankly, they just get better as, as more of the fingerprints of these other people are all over them. They kind of go from concept things to, to something tangible and something musically cohesive. It's always mm. so fascinating to me, the songwriting process, like the, the patience and the time and the coming back to it and and then when you have all these like I love that your influences are so eclectic because that's I mean Luke and I just have that conversation about how you would never be able to pigeonhole us just like you musically like which influence sort of takes dominance to to create your sound at any given time yeah. and how they all play together yeah, yeah. just yeah, yeah well but, yeah you know it's so true you would like to think that that a successful musical creation is like this immaculate conception, but it's not, there's always references. And it's it's almost embarrassing when, you know, the drummer walks in and says, well, you know, this is sort of a Radiohead thing, or this is sort of a fly in the family stone. I'm like, yeah, well, cool, but like this part. <laughs> Like that part is like a Pat Metheny intro from the Pat Metheny group and Lyle Mays in 1980, whatever. And then, you know, um, so it's sort of almost disappointing or embarrassing to admit that what we write is often a compilation of references. Um, the good news is it was for fucking everybody else, too. It was for Stevie Wonder and it, and, and it is for, I mean, every piano part of an Adele song 
is derived in one way or the other from Ravel or Bach or Mozart. Mozart. Granted, these are reduced versions of those, the work of those artists, but it is, it's like every song and the body of your work is, it's like a constellation of, of, of grand theft lar larceny of other people's work, if you know what I mean. I was going to say scrapbook, but that sounds better. Yeah, um, way cooler. Way that, easier yeah. to bring up at a party than scrapbook. Right, no. <laughs> use that one. I'm yes. going to use that one. I'm going to that one to my wife and see if she'll marry me again. We've, been, we've only Perfect. been married for 20 some odd years. Let's see if she'll marry me again after I say that. We'll see. But just that, that idea, like, yeah, that everything, I mean, everything obviously is influenced by what came before it. And it's a question of just, you know, I mean, there's the only 12 notes you can play type thing of like, well, at some point you're going to hit the same order as somebody else but that yeah. idea like you said of well let's make this sound like lindsey buckingham circa yeah. 74 and then we'll yeah. throw that to a, you know the drums that sound like this right I, I mean all music is in some ways a bit of a a scrapbook or a journey for somebody because who, who even if it's not the person making it where you go it is. i hear that bass line and i know that tone comes from yeah someplace yeah, yeah. else no, the, the 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 yeah. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. No, no, go ahead. Yeah, and then every once in a while, you actually do something truly new, and sometimes people hate it, and sometimes they like it, or both. Um, and that's very gratifying. And with all of the technology inside the box, like I'm in my studio right now. If we were to walk over there, we go to where the computer stuff is and where our engineer works, and like the endless like array of sounds and special effects and sonic tweaks and sonic anomalies that you can create, right? They sh you shouldn't create an anomaly, but it, you know, is it's cool and it's endless. So with all of that technology, you straddle the fence of doing something cool and genuinely new and just becoming a, a, a kind of um, another person at their computer creating shitty music that sounds really di digital. Um, but but somewhere somewhere in there, there can be something really new. And even harmonically and rhythmically, the good news is there are so many configurations of chord changes and so many ways to arrange notes with varying rhythms that it is still possible to do, to, to do new things. But again, invar invariably in any song that you do, somehow or other, even inadvertently, you're referencing other things. As we learned, of course, in Ed Sheeran's victory in the lawsuit, where he sort of right. said, hey guys, like that's been played already 500,000 times. Go ahead and sue me if you want, but you don't, you don't have any grounds to sue me. That was an interesting, besides the legal concepts involved, that was an interesting window into the fact of, of the, the inevitable copycatting involved in, in the creation of, of music, you know? Now, I know you make your own guitars right you build well you know. i don't build i don't build guitars myself but i am a, a really um a devout carpenter um and i have made like parts of guitars and stuff um but i don't i don't make them i do have relationships with luthiers who make guitars for me um but okay. i don't actually build guitars myself that would get into the exaggeration zone right well <laughs> just even in that um you know, in that process of working with a luthier and saying, I want it to look like this or do this, like how, I mean, again, talking about sound, talking about tone, the amount of thought that goes into every single, well, if we use this wood, if it's this thick, all of that oh, stuff, yeah. like it's such a. Oh, it's, it's one of the most beautiful processes around. I have a few luthiers that I work with, with, um, yeah, it's too bad. The, I don't have one they're elsewhere in the studio. I mean, I, I do not mean to shame or embarrass the guitar you're holding because that no, is a no, this beauty. Is, this, yeah, this is a 1940-something um, Gibson. I'm not that big into vintages, but this vintage sounded really good, so I bought it. Um, yeah. But, but, um, but yeah, working with the Luthier is so cool because, you know, it's a weird thing to throw so much of your personality into a medium like music and to... And to have the instrument of that medium, the pipe of that medium, be production made. And it's like, well, I write my own songs, my own music, and people are like, well, what do you play? And you're like, well, I play a Fender, or I play a whatever. Okay. So like over the years, I've gotten into having guitars made for me uh, 
sometimes more expensive, sometimes less. Um, because I feel it's it really is part of like the expression. And 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 I love it. And these craftsmen are so good at what they do. It's really technical, it's really tricky. There's steam bending, there's inlay work, there's logic, there's tone woods, there's testing the tone. Dude, there's a lot of stuff involved. And so I love being adjacent to that process of crafts craftsmanship and i also um feel that when you have a guitar made for you it's it's it it just gets you closer to your own expression if that makes if that yeah if that makes any sense mm -hmm. definitely nice. trying to trying to find that voice or right. relationship for the longest time i never understood why people changed out guitars so often in shows especially when it's one fender for another but yeah. then when you're dealing with, you know, more vintage instruments or things that are crafted, you know, uh, and very intentionally for you, then that sound becomes such a thing. Did you, yeah. went along in the process of playing music, did you kind of go like, oh, I guess this is my sound? Or oh. you still think you're digging around for that? I'm always digging around for it. But somewhere in between falling in love with Pat Metheny, John Schofield, Peter Frampton, um, Manuel Barreco, um, you know, Pete Town. I mean, like, uh, you know, um, uh, somewhere in between falling in love with all those different sounds, I sort of formed my own sound. And I do like to expand. I do like the pure sound of a guitar or a Strat or an acoustic. But man, I love the toys. Um, you can't see, but right here I have all kinds of synth stuff. And I do, I do love pushing the guitar to the point where it doesn't sound like a guitar anymore. Because a pianist and a horn player will play certain things naturally because of the physical nature of the instrument. And a right. guitar will play certain things because of the physical nature of the instrument. But when you completely change the sound, you have someone playing another sound that wouldn't necessarily one wouldn't necessarily expect a certain configuration of notes or approach, you know, to be associated with. So it's really cool when you play guitar-y stuff, you know, like stuff like that, like, and yet you're doing some weird synth sound. And of course, the greatest pioneer of that in history in the last 60 years is Pat Metheny. I mean, I mean, th th this guy had, you know, 50 wires coming out of his guitar in 1982. And it, I don't I don't know to this day if people appreciate the sonic evolution of what he did. Um, it's just the guy was a, a, a complete full out fucking genius. Sonically. <laughs> <laughs> and, and otherwise, but yeah. particularly. Yeah. Sonically. Yeah, 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 yeah. Terrible neighbor. Sonic well, ours and whatever. I mean, um. <laughs> have it all. Right, exactly. I mean, which would you choose? Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's so amazing, like the I don't know, like you're like you're saying, like the 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 engineering and the technicality and all those elements. And I it never occurred to me until we just had this conversation, what you said about, you know, how it's such the ultimate creative expression to make music. But everyone talks about this like mass produced commercial cookie cutter elements. I've never, all of the interviews and all of the music I've listened to never occurred to me. You know, I don't know if I'm old or not. Well, I'm definitely old, but I don't oh, know if I am too. <laughs> well, I, maybe, I don't know. I'll speak for myself. You guys, you guys don't look old. I, I'm 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 older, but but you know, um I don't know if this is because I'm old or not. But I think that music, um, for the most part, is getting worse. Um, there's too much inside the box. The use of the technology is overdone. Um, and, you know, one thing that really bothers me is this notion of collaboration. Now, you would say, well, what's wrong with Gideon if he doesn't like collaboration? Doesn't everyone worship the concept of collaboration? And I would say, yes, of course, intrinsically, the concept of productive collaboration is cool. It's a wonderful thing. It's a, but that's not what I'm referring to. Like so often you turn on a pop tune and you're like, X, Y, Z wrote this. And there's like nine writers on the song. 
and there's right. like 26 producers and you're like well how is that a personal expression or even an honest expression coming from a place of feeling or concern or whatever is the catalyzing factor to writing, writing music if 550,000 people have written the song and that kind of depersonalization and fractionalization. I don't know if that's such a word, fractionalization. It sounds Whatever. good. Yeah, it sounds cool. Yeah. If you it brought it up now. at a party, I wouldn't. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. right, right. We'll do it at a party. We got so we to gotta go to a party. Like, we've been talking a <laughs> yeah. lot about this party. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. But, like, that kind of fractionalization of music, I think, is super depressing and is a cop-out. And it's cool, of course, because if I go and I collaborate with four famous musicians, we all feature each other on Spotify and we all get each other's streams and it's a good business card. But my one of the singers in my band said modern music making is just a, it's just giving people a business card at this point with all these names on it. And he was so right mm. when he said that. I, I was a little drunk when he said that, so I didn't appreciate it at the time. But now, having sobered up, I, 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 I know what he means. And I can't stand it. This song features, you know, Ed Sheeran, Adele, and Wiz Khalifa, and The Weeknd, and Bubba. And by the time you're done, you're like, well, that's super depressing. Who is the artist? And what was the intentionality behind it? So modern music is is hard for me. I love a lot of it. Again, I love Miley Cyrus. I love Adele. I mean, there's so many artists I love. Hiatus, Coyote. And there's millions of snarky. But, but, but the singularity of the expression and the... The me the, the the way the the part that the part that music plays in people's lives I think is different than it used to be. Sort of like well I'm listening to you know Dua Lipa while I'm working out, but that's different than when you like ran to 86th Street and Lexington Avenue to get like the newest Neil Young or Steely Dan album, and you'd come home and you'd look at the artwork and you'd read the liner notes and you'd see who's playing on it, and it was like this whole meditative experience surrounding the introduction of this new nine songs to you. And that shit's gone, man. I just think that's gone. And that's super sad to me, the contemplative, really personal part of it. I don't know. It's kind of a bummer, I think. It's creeping back in a little bit. Like, I don't think it'll ever be what we experienced, but I see it with my niece who's 16 and I, or, yeah, 15 actually. And I just took her to her first record store day and she went oh, cool. through that whole thing like you know every element exactly what we all did and so seeing it through her eyes and how excited she is and some of her friends so if there's like little pockets right that are kind of experiencing that piece where i think it'll have some it's got to gain some traction because there's nothing like it can't get worse i mean can't get worse that's true it's got to get better (laughs) it might get worse it might get worse I, I was going to say, how can it get if worse? If you bring but... that up at the party, you can't come to the party. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> By the way, I just want to let you guys know, I've lost faith in this party ever happening. I don't even think like... <laughs> oh, no, this party's know. happening. No, yeah. You guys, are, you, guys are all, you guys are all talk and no... I want drugs, <laughs> I want drugs and guns at the party. I want it all, but it's like... I don't Lawyers, see guns, money. Party. No, it's happening. It's, it's happening. totally... We're going to... Yeah. Yes. <laughs> the party is going to happen. Right, right. When you least expect it. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> but let's talk a little bit about the band because yes. it's a very uh, amorphous group of musicians. Is that is that a good way to describe it? Or it kind of changes well, and moves and yeah, I mean, there's a core, there's a nucleus, and then we do rotate some people in and out. We have Michael Mayo who joins us on and off. He's toured with Herbie Hancock and worked with Jacob Collier and done all kinds of stuff. Caleb Hawley is in and out of it. He has a good solo career, but also joins us. Um, you know, we've had everyone from John Schofield to Johnny, Donnie McClaslin to Mark Boussard to Grace Weber to James Genus, the bassist for Daft Punk and the Saturday Night Live Band, be part of the band. When we perform and right now, it is mostly the same group of people, but not completely, not totally, and not unilaterally the same people. Because, you know, if you're going to play live, you have to have some cohesion. You can't have it be like a yeah. shuffling, shuffling, shuffling the deck chairs too much, you know, otherwise it's chaos uh, too much. I like chaos, but just not too much chaos. And so, um, but listen, the common denominator for me of the band is, um, is they're just great musical athletes. Um, my piano player is a great jazz piano player and a great pop piano player can manipulate sonic you know, ideas uh, is a phenomenal classical. I mean, he's just, he's a great musical athlete. 
Um, I wouldn't say we're the coolest people. We don't look that cool. I don't think. Um, I wish we looked cooler, but I wish I looked cooler, but like, it's not going to happen. Um, these are music nerds. Um, and, 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 but that's the way you get the coolest, most original, most cohesive stuff. Um, all capable, all great musical athletes, a lot of three-part harmonies, some complex chord changes for sure. Um, and really nice people. And, uh, the other common denominator is a psychological common denominator where it's like no hurt feelings, you know, just, just like. I just don't care if someone says, Gideon, I hate that idea. Um, let's do this instead. I, it just, it's just a song, you know, like mm -hmm. it's really, this is, we're not, you know, I said this on a radio show recently, like we're not, we're not curing pediatric cancer here. Right. Like we don't have to be right. And the stakes aren't that high. I mean, I know a lot of artists say, Oh, well, we changed the world with our music. I don't know. Maybe that's true or not. I, I try it's to. It's not up to you to decide in many ways. Yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. I sort of avoid that bullshit. So, like, I'm saying, like, we're making a song. Let's try and turn out a really good product. Let's try and do something interesting. And to the extent that anybody can't take criticism or change their mind, you know, fuck them. Like, like, let's get someone new in the band. So, we've really distilled this over time down to a group of people that are fun, can laugh at me, can laugh at themselves. Um, and who, I mean, I mean, I'm pretty much the worst musician in the band. Um, and that's not some nonsense, sort of fake self-deprecation. I kind of am. Um, and so uh, I write most of the music, but I'm the worst musician in a lot of ways. And um, and so I like that. I mean, that's just cool because I'm always learning. Um, just a tremendously mature group of creators. And that's what you need is some... You need some maturity, you know? It's it's a weird thing to say, right? You would think like, oh, it's all about the creativity. It, it is about creativity, but it's it's really about the maturity just to stay at it. Like yeah. if you're if you're framing up a woodshed and putting the roof on, it's like stay at it until the woodshed's done. Um, and then and then finish it with lacquer. You know what I mean? And and get it done, get the woodshed done. And that's that's how we approach every song, which is yeah. why we have 40 songs out there on Spotify. Well, Gideon, you make very beautiful woodsheds. <laughs> Let me put it that way. Peel away that pretty bark, take deep root in my soul. Cause it's 2 a.m. in East New York, and I'm cooking. For more information, you can check out Gideon King and City Blog on their website, which is GideonKingCityBlog.com. They are also on Facebook, where they are at Facebook.com slash GideonKingCityBlog, and on Instagram, where they are at Instagram.com slash GideonKingCityBlog. You can check us out on all the various socials. Be sure to visit our website at RockAndRollGradSchool.com, and don't forget to leave us a review. Today's show is produced by myself and Heidi Hegquist. Our reluctant producers are John Sauvé and Sandy Stone. Our willing producers are Rachel Allen and Randy Jeanette. Our intern is Zach Jackson. This one's for Philippe. Thank you, good night, and may all your favorite bands stay together. Too long.